Throughout the centuries, mankind has searched for answers to questions such as, why are we here? What is the nature of God in the world around us? And is there life after death? But perhaps the ultimate of all such questions relates to our own eternal reality. And it is this quest for who we really are that lies at the heart of all spiritual endeavor. India, the world's sixth largest country with more than a billion inhabitants, an enchanting land filled with great vestiges of divine inspiration. It's here that sages and philosophers like Adi Shankaracharya, Swami Vivekananda and the poet Saint Kabir have delved deep into this mystery called life. Proponents of the Hindu philosophy of Advaita, they held that our real nature is divine. God is our innermost self, an underlying reality that exists in every being. The basic teaching is that we should awaken ourselves from the mistaken belief that we exist as separate individuals. Advaita simply means that the ultimate reality is non-separate. The aim of Advaita is to liberate the soul from a cycle of reincarnation. In our daily life, the life of duality, which has to be, even in that life, everything is connected. The path towards salvation is through knowledge, knowledge of the self and the realization that one's soul or self or Atman is non-different, absolutely identical with the Absolute Self. <laughs> to better understand the philosophy, we set off on an adventure that led us to the teachings of three revered saints of this ancient and mystical land. Our first destination was the small city of Tiruvannamalai in the south of India where we had arranged to meet David Godman. David is regarded as the foremost contemporary author on the lives of some of India's famous mystics, including the great sage Ramana Maharishi. I first heard about Ramana probably in 1974, when I picked up a book in my college bookstore in England. I devoured it in an afternoon. And I have, I have to say, the effect of reading that book was to completely silence my mind. Up till that point, I'd been a voracious reader of spiritual books, philosophical texts. I had a, an insatiable curiosity to find things out. And what was different with this text is that it didn't provide any answers. It simply pulled the rug out completely from under the whole questioning edifice. David's first encounter with the teachings of Ramana Maharishi was so profound that he was irresistibly drawn to India. This fateful expedition was to be a major turning point on his own journey of discovery, and he now calls India his home. <laughs> Starting out as a librarian at Maharishi's spiritual center in Teruvannamalai, David has dedicated his life to authoring meticulously researched books on the same. Ramana Maharshi is probably the most distinguished and widely respected Hindu saint of the last hundred years. Ramana was renowned for the direct method of self-inquiry that he taught. He said that we exist as the Supreme Self at all times and that we need only awaken to this reality by seeking the true source of abiding happiness our own inner self. Ramana's insights have provided answers to seekers all over the world, but what was the story that led the Maharishi to these eternal truths? Venkataraman, later to be known to the world as Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharishi, was born in 1879 in a small town near Madurai in South India, on a day sacred to the Hindu god Shiva. His parents were renowned for being both charitable and intensely devoted to God. 
While there was nothing particularly distinctive about his early years, he had a remarkable spiritual awakening at the age of 16. Sitting in a small room in his uncle's house, the thought occurred to him that he was about to die. The feeling of impending death did not unnerve the young boy. Instead, it culminated in a spontaneous inquiry, during which Ramana recognized his true nature as immortal spirit. Losing all interest in his former life, the young sage decided to leave home. He wrote a brief note to his family and secretly embarked on a journey to the holy pilgrimage site of Arunachala. After an epic and eventful train ride, Ramana arrived at the city's main temple. Although it was closed at the time, all the doors are said to have miraculously opened as the sage made his way to the innermost shrine. The temple became the first place of residence for Ramana. Here, he sat for long periods of time, deeply absorbed in the bliss of the self. So complete was his disassociation with his physical body that he remained oblivious, even after being assailed by street urchins and insects. In 1899, Ramana moved up the hill to Virupaksha cave, which was to be his home for the next 16 years. His silent radiance inevitably drew a small group of devotees to him, and he soon acquired the reputation of a sage. Shortly after being joined by his mother in 1914, Ramana moved further up the hill to Skandashram, a larger site built by one of his disciples. When his mother passed away in 1922, Bhagwan made his final move to the foot of the Arunachala mountain, where his mother had been laid to rest. As the years rolled by, a spiritual community of the Maharishi's followers developed into an ashram that still stands today. At the heart of the Ramana ashram is a small meditation room in which pilgrims would come to seek Ramana's guidance in their spiritual pursuits. For many visitors, the all-pervading silence of Bhagavan was sufficient to enable a direct experience of the Self. Now this hall was, I think for everyone concerned, a, a truly magical place. I've come across so many accounts of people who were attracted to Ramana or merely came to see him casually, who came to Ramana Ashram, and this would be the place where they would have their first meeting, mostly. They would come with questions, they would come with problems, they would come with headfuls of ideas. And the most common response was that everything they brought with them simply disappeared. Whoever was in the hall, it is Bhagwan who, Bhagwan's presence dominated, regardless of which person came. That was a natural state. The passage of time has done little to diminish the Maharishi's transformative energy, which is still tangibly felt by devotees today. I stood before that couch where he used to sit, and then I found, I have found my guru. And then the questions which have been, had been troubling me for thousands of years, hmm? and were answered in a minute by his silence. Why, how, I can't say, because Bhagavan, Bhagavan is basically an inner guru. For those seekers who were unable to grasp the Maharishi's silent teachings, he recommended a simple method of self-inquiry, whereby attention is continually brought to the feeling of I, within. Ramana said, I exist is the only permanent self-evident experience of everyone. Nothing else is so self-evident as I am. It is only by diving deep into the spiritual heart that we can find the unconditional peace and bliss of the self. In his daily life, Ramana Maharishi exhibited many saintly qualities. Possessing only a simple white loincloth and walking stick, he accepted no special treatment for himself. 
One very noticeable and very distinctive aspect of his lifestyle was the utter uncompromising egalitarianism he displayed to not only the people who came but also the animals in his presence. With the St. Francis-like ability to commune with animals, squirrels, monkeys and peacocks all seemed to flourish under the loving and protective grace of Bhagwan. Not having the capacity for intellectualization or having any problems with ideas in their head, they just felt a natural, unconditional devotion to him and he felt that and responded. Intuitively drawn to Arunachala at a young age, Bhagwan's love for the physical form of the mountain only deepened with time. He loved to walk along its slopes and even acknowledged it as his guru. Today, scores of pilgrims perambulate its base as a sacred act of reverence. They, like many saints and seekers through the ages, are mysteriously drawn to this most extraordinary of sacred sites. In the late 1940s, Maharishi's health began to fail due to the appearance of a malignant sarcoma on his arm. Despite the debilitating condition, he insisted that all who came be given full access to him. While his physical body became increasingly frail, his towering spiritual presence remained intact. During his final days, streams of people filed past his room to catch a last glimpse of the great sage of Arunachala. The Maharishi reassured grieving devotees, while the death of his physical body was imminent, his true formless self remained eternally present. Miraculously, at the final moment of death, thousands witnessed a large comet trail across the night sky and disappear behind the holy mountain. Ramana Ashram continues to flourish today, with seekers from all corners of the globe coming to soak in the sanctified surrounds and to connect more deeply to Bhagavan and his teachings. Maharishi's shrine is still said to silently emanate his spiritual aura, and many continue to have the same experience of perfect peace that Ramana radiated in his lifetime. Amongst the many visitors here is Dr. Nicholas Sutton from the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. Advaita isn't just a philosophy, it's also based on mystical experience. Uh, and, and Ramana Maharshi himself, who was here, he wasn't a philosopher, he was a mystic. He didn't need to explain logically Advaita, but he knew the truth of Advaita because he had experienced it in a, in a mystical experience that he had early in life. Many of Ramana's personal effects are treated as sacrosanct and original manuscripts of his teachings are carefully preserved with modern state-of-the-art technology. No effort has been spared in restoring the precious photo and film archive. Visiting this simple Indian village, it seems as though we have journeyed to the very heart of the world. Images of Ramana abound everywhere, and despite the gradual encroachment of modern modes of living, we appear to have travelled to somewhere truly timeless. Reluctant to take our leave from this most hallowed of places, we made our way back to David's home on the outskirts of the city. While the main body of David's work as an author consists of the life and teachings of Ramana, over the years it has expanded to include a number of Maharishi's disciples. His three-volume anthology, Nothing Ever Happened, documents the extraordinary life of one such devotee, Sri Punjaji, or Papaji, as he was fondly known. I first went to Papaji 
to ask him questions about a book I was compiling of experiences of Ramana devotees. I found his story so amazing, so full of incidents, I decided to turn that chapter into a full-length book and then as the material continuously expanded it was two books, it was three books and by the time I'd finished it was a three-volume, 1,200-page biography. He has, I would say, the most extraordinary life of anybody I've ever come across. Um, miracles, visions, dramatic experiences. For his entire life he's been meeting complete strangers, having brief and absolutely phenomenal exchanges with them, leaving those people with a direct experience of the self. Fired up with an all-consuming love for Lord Krishna, he traversed the length and breadth of India in search of a master who could help him see God. In 1944, he met Ramana Maharishi, who told him, God is within you. He is not apart from you. If you find the source of the mind by asking yourself, Who am I? You will experience God in your heart as the Self. Papaji's life and spiritual understanding were profoundly transformed. He later recalled, The silent gaze of Maharishi re-established me in the primal state. The desire to search for an external God perished in the direct experience of the Self, and I knew that my spiritual quest had ended. Papaji continued to work and support a large extended family after his awakening. While he never considered himself to be a teacher, many came to regard him as their guru. Although Papaji passed away in 1997, we hoped that by traveling to his home in the northern city of Lucknow, we'd be able to find out more about his life and to meet some of his family and devotees. In a modest and simple home, his room and effects have been carefully preserved by his family, for whom Papaji's loving presence played a dual role of father and teacher. Really, he is very affectionate and loving father and grandfather. And he is so minutely observe everybody's action, what they are doing, my children, I and my mother-in-law. He just observe and uh, just to teach my uh, son and daughter. And he very much curious about the daily routine hour, what we are doing. He changed my way of looking at the world, you know, so that, uh, you know, I used to think that God was outside of myself, God was something to pray to, um, and now I realize that God is within me. Lovingly called the Lion of Lucknow by his devotees, Papaji's room bears evidence of his deep love for Lord Krishna as a young boy, and for his master later in life. Paging through some of his diaries, we found some remarkable spiritual wisdom. He writes that we are free here and now, and that we need not strive or practice to realize the ever-present self. All that is required is to stop all effort and to simply remain quiet. To quieten the mind is very difficult, and if you could do it, you are free. And that is most happiest occasion of your life. vibrantly colorful and noisy streets of Lucknow, we met Nurupa. Like many Westerners, she came to India in her youth, searching for spiritual truth. What brings me and continues to bring me still to Lucknow is uh, the living, loving presence of the Master. Ah, 
Outside Satsang Bhavan, the building in which Papaji gave daily spiritual discourses, Nirupa stops for a glass of steaming hot spiced tea from the local chai bala. He has been providing this welcome service to many who have travelled here over the years and is himself rumoured to be in an elevated spiritual state. Her encounters with many spiritual masters, such as Papaji, have deepened Narupa's understanding of life and the nature of self. Although she follows the teachings of another guru, Narupa regularly comes to visit Satsang Bhavan. Away from the crowded streets, she finds a little time and space here for quiet reflection and contemplation in this tranquil haven. She recalls how Papaji encouraged seekers to call off the spiritual search and to recognize freedom in this moment. The problem is from birth we're taught or filled up with ideas that yeah, how we have to be, how we are. We're filled up that it's a struggle and being with a master is emptying it all out and realizing that actually we have always been and are always pure. And we have to just be without all these ideas and concepts. And this is another trap. Through illuminating personal trap, exchanges with trap, devotees, Papaji shattered trap, concepts about both freedom, freedom and trap. bondage. You should be out of both these traps, neither of bondage nor of freedom. Because this is a concept. Bondage was a concept. Now, concept of freedom. Get rid of both these concepts. Then, where are you? Hmm? Here. Here, yeah. Yeah. Here is neither a trap of bondage nor of freedom. Here is here. For me, the way he taught was always personal and always for you to actually, to, to, to get it, you know, get what it is you need to see. Papaji, so far as I could make out, wanted transactions, not relationships. He wanted people to come, sit with him. He would explain the teachings. He would say, do who am I? Find out what the source of this I is. Not as a practice, don't go away and do this. Look at your eye right now and tell me what you see. He wanted you to actually do the practice with him glaring at you. And people who took up that invitation would often find that their eye, their sense of self, just completely evaporated in that moment. And I saw it happen again and again and again. People would just stop mid-sentence sometimes. Sometimes they'd burst out laughing, sometimes they'd cry. Something immense actually happened to them in that moment. And when they did wake up, again, they were so alive, their faces were lit up. And if they started speaking, it was like they were talking from the Upanishads. It was quite extraordinary that these people who had come from the West with no spiritual background, hadn't read any books, didn't know the vocabulary. After five minutes of sitting with this man, they could stand up and give a speech, really sounding like an enlightened sage from ancient history. It, it was quite remarkable what he could do. I was able to sit near Papaji at the front in the first time and, and just spontaneously tears started coming down my cheeks and it was this sense of having met a real master. The way Papaji looks at you is not like looking at somebody else, like some other person or personality. He looked straight to himself when he looked at you and himself, which is the same in all of us. As soon as I saw Papaji, I was, I was just, everything stopped. My mind just stopped. I was like, I don't know, I guess all of my carefully constructed concepts and strategies and ideas and they just, they just, none of them had anywhere to fit, so they all just stopped. The meeting with Papaji is never in time, it's never a meeting 
that you put in time or in space and as an experience, oh, once upon a time I met Apogee. The meeting with the Sadhguru may start but never ends. It's just, it's a meeting. It's emptiness meeting emptiness. It's, it's freedom meeting freedom. He gave you your, your moment in heaven, if you like, your, your absolute rock-solid assurance of what was real and what was not. And even if it went away afterwards, you had this absolute unshaking knowledge of what he was talking about. It wasn't some abstraction that you were moving towards, it was something you actually had and known for yourself while you were with him. Bargo Devasya Dhimahi Dio Yoma Prachodayat Back at Satsang Bhavan, we met Pankaj, a resident from the neighboring area. Although Papaji never prescribed traditional forms of religious practices, Pankaj comes here daily to perform a Hindu ritual to the portrait of his master as an act of gratitude. A keen trader, he was at first drawn to Satsang Bhavan, thinking that the large number of foreign devotees around Papaji presented a lucrative business opportunity. But his time with the master gradually affected a shift in his priorities. Till Papa was surviving, I was not understood him, his teachings fully. But after his dismissal, the night when he left away his body, when all of we people gathered here, I realized that he is straight entering in me and he is telling me, don't worry Pankaj. I am not gone anywhere, I am within you. You just look at yourself inside and you will find me that I am always there. And really I have realized it. Whenever I have I'm in any trouble, I just came in his feet and he just take me out like a knife from the butter. Gunnar, another follower at the house, has his own way of expressing his devotion to Papaji. I studied music on the university. I have taught music on a college in many years, but I would say that uh, the smiling man you see in the background, he is uh, the best mu music teacher I ever had. When I came to uh, lockdown in 92, 93, 94, I stayed in 94 for one year, I think Papaji, he got tired of all the Vedantic philosophical questions. So he was looking at people when they came with their great questions about life and death at the moment and not the moment and things like this. He looked at them and said, sing a song. Or he said, stand up and dance like this. He made people happy and they stayed happy. He was a jovial extrovert full of beans, full of life character, who absolutely radiated joy. And if you, if you look at the pictures of people in Satsang, you'll probably see 200 people extraordinarily happy, laughing, beaming faces. Just being around him made you happy. That was what he did all his life. So when I first got to Lucknow, I just saw the most beautiful women and men and happy, smiling, laughing, joking, free, simple, unstressed out people. And before I even met Papaji in person, at that at person, I felt, I remember I felt I'm home. Om Prakash Sayal was one of Papaji's earliest devotees and met him during a chance encounter on a railway platform in 1969. He was mesmerized by Papaji's physical presence and immediately recognized him as his guru. His devotion is still apparent today. Master is a great shelter, you can see, is the biggest umbrella. Under that umbrella, if a devotee is standing, the rain is rain, or clouds 
are thunderstorms cannot touch touch him Om Prakash was blessed with many personal encounters with Papaji and came to fully understand the essence of his teachings Simplicity was his main teaching Whatever you are be as you are He meant you are free this moment Why you are waiting for You feel you are not free only because you are stuck to something your mind is stuck to something unless i get this i'm not going to be satisfied stuck to material world beyond material world astral world if you drop all your likings then you are free right now right this moment As we prepare to leave Lucknow, one thing was certain that meeting Papa Ji had a profoundly transformative effect on those who came to see him. He was indescribable. He was everything and nothing always in the same time. He he was the most authentic human being well that I ever had the good luck to come across. I mean, I know a lot of people like to draw distinctions and say oh the teacher is just a finger pointing to the moon, but for me he was the moon itself. So he done more than everything for me for me it was so simple so ordinary and this was the greatest miracle his vast emptiness when you meet papa ji he will relief chamber full you become light he just so deeply reorganized um everything incredible 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 During the 1980s, David Godman was a regular visitor to another great spiritual master. In the late 1970s, probably 1978, I started meeting several people who had been to Bombay to see Nisargadatta Maharaj. Now I wasn't particularly impressed by his teachings or anything else he had to stay i i knew the advaita teaching and anyone can spout that what did impress me was the absolutely radiant faces of the people who were coming back they'd go up there looking a bit a bit glum and they they'd come back like they had you know three foot white halos coming out of the side of their head and ear, ear to ear grins on their face that didn't go away for weeks and i thought this this is something i want to experience for myself Traveling to Nisargadatta's place of residence in the coastal city of Mumbai, the sublime presence of a saint seems unlikely amidst the grinding poverty and squalor that is so apparent all around. Nisargadatta passed away in 1981, but it was right here in this humble tenement loft that still remains occupied by some of Maharaj's family that he met with spiritual seekers from all over the world. the whole place the whole room it just seeps into you in a a way that's very hard to describe um he he was very argumentative he was he was the complete antithesis of bhagavan in many ways he didn't like sitting in silence if no one had anything to say he generally complained and he'd say come on don't waste my time ask me a question somebody say something um he liked quarreling he liked arguing he was feisty If people got feisty back, he'd throw them out. I mean, he was—he was not, by anyone's definition, a saintly man. His anger was not for getting anything. His anger was giving something to his disciples. Please try to understand what I am telling you. This is the thinking behind that anger. He did have. an absolutely extraordinary ability to show you who you were as he was talking to you this is what really impressed me and the way i saw it happen was that people would come to see him 
And everybody comes with some sort of intellectual, spiritual baggage. They think they know what the world is, how it works. They might have decided they found some way of transcending the world or getting to some peaceful state. Everybody came with a structure. So he liked to sit people down and say, who's your teacher, what books have you read, what's your practice? And slowly, slowly he'd entice you to construct your own edifice that you thought explained the world or what your role in it was. And simultaneously while he was doing this, he would be emanating some power, some shakti, which actually showed you who you really were in that moment. So you, you could see this, this split, this kind of dichotomy on people's faces, that half, half of them was busy making this kind of Lego fake reality that they were putting on display piece by piece. And then slowly, slowly you could see inside them, they were actually beginning to experience what he wanted you to experience. And at some point you had to make a choice between your own conceptual structure, which you just laid out for him, and this direct experience, which he'd just given to you, which absolutely, totally refuted all the things that you were trying to explain. And there was a, some people would just blunder ahead, they'd carry on with their structures, their ideas, they couldn't drop. And with other people, there'd be this, almost a laugh, a kind of, okay, now I see the joke. And they'd just shut up and they'd sit there in this state of beingness, of knowledge, which he was somehow emanating to you at the same time that you were trying to explain your worldview. And eventually you threw your own worldview out and accepted his because that was your experience. The spirited question and answer sessions that took place were later transcribed and collected in the book, I Am That. The publication brought Maharaj worldwide recognition and has come to be regarded as a spiritual classic. Maharaj lived the mundane life of a petty trader and family man for a number of years after his realization. Each morning he would walk down this busy street to his small trading kiosk where he sold hand-rolled cigarettes called beedies. According to Nisargadatta, the ultimate purpose of spirituality is to know who you are. In Marathi it is Swala Jana Niswastara. Make yourself known to yourself. You should know yourself first and be quiet. Nisar Gadatta was born in 1897. An introspective and inquisitive boy, his thirst for spiritual truth ultimately led him to his guru in 1932. Beginning his spiritual practices with great faith and determination, within just three years, realization dawned and Maharaj reached the supreme state of self-awareness. Like the man himself, Nisargadatta's teaching is the essence of simplicity. We're all asleep in the dream of ignorance, and in order to wake up to our natural state, we need do nothing more than witness ourselves in silence, remaining quietly alert to the feeling, I am, within. As the day drew to a close, we made our way across the city to one of Maharaja's respected translators. Although 93 years of age, Mr. Mulapatan's memories of Nisargadatta and his teachings are still crystal clear. See, Nisargadatta's teaching is normally what used to happen during translations. People of different levels used to come, from KG class to higher classes. Now, according to the quality of the person, intuitively, the teaching would come out of him. You follow? Intuitively. Because many times I asked him, Maharaj, could you repeat the answer? He said, how, how, how can I talk? There is no memory here. The talk has come and it is gone, suitable for that person. I can't repeat. So then I could understand, it is not, it is a body was like a cassette player. And the, the teachings used to come 
from the absolute, from the primordial principle that comes from the same. It is like that. They don't act, they don't exist as body. They are one with the primordial principle. Maharaja's ultimate message, though, was that we need to transcend all teaching and simply abide in being. He said, "Forget me, embodied guru, embodied guru." Forget my teachings, but please do one thing: go into your own being. Just be without mind. Just be, and watch your mind. Just so all the mind, the thoughts are occur. Watch the thoughts, but don't participate. Don't judge the thoughts. When you are doing this process. Exact teachings necessary for you will intuitively come out of you for you hundred percent. The real ultimate teaching comes out of you for you. So we have to go in world, make your mind zero, and try to become the primordial principle, the ultimate. After that, you have no birth. You are one with the absolute. Within the heart, the whole and part of everything I see. Behind the eyes, beyond the skies, reflecting me. At the silent core. And yet, before horror of phenomena began, oh, and after it, and after it, I am. On our return to South Africa, we travelled to the sleepy town of Magrega to meet the Funda Vestasen family. Who are devout followers of the teachings of Ramana Maharishi? Directly across from the town church, their family home is named after the holy mountain that Ramana called his guru. I think even from a tender age, I was interested in the sorts of questions: uh, Who am I? Why am I here? And I found that uh, as a youngster, I couldn't really. Discover my true context, or I couldn't find the the right way in which to apply that search. And then, about 19 years ago, I came across the teachings of Ramana Maharshi, and that was、um, I can only describe it as a coming home for me. The answer had finally been delivered to me so clearly that、uh, there was no more need for seeking. I'd gone from someone who felt like a seeker to someone who felt like a finder, and. With that finding,、uh, has come increasing peace through the years. I have found that it's、uh, informed virtually every aspect of my life: my relationship with my four children, my relationship with my partner, the way in which I do my work, my lifestyle.、Uh, I find that everything is more relaxed. I see that, for example, with my children. Um, I approach each one as if they were Ramana, and in fact, that's what Ramana would tell me—that they are. That is the truth. Okay, another four. Ramana, when asked once about free will, was holding a fan in his hand and fanning himself, and his reply was, "He says, even me picking up this fan and fanning myself is predetermined." He says, "Whatever the body is to go through is predetermined in this lifetime." He says, "Just surrender. Just know." That the will of God is done. What the teachings have come to represent in my life are that I don't hold on to the concepts anymore. So the only way that I've come to understand what Ramana says is by going within and abiding in that space. For Peter, delving deeper into the wisdom of Ramana was accompanied by an urge to share the teachings with others. I then set about writing a book, which I've been busy with for probably the past ten years or more,、um, and I've simply entitled it "Awareness is Another Name for You." And the aim of that was 
to put those teachings in a very simple form, to remove all the terminology, Sanskrit or otherwise, however beautiful, however meaningful or potent those words are, and to make it accessible to Westerners. Initially, with my practice, I suppose I had a sense of uh, being a rescuer, that there were people out there who needed help, who needed rescuing. And what I came to realize with Ramana's teachings is, in fact, that there are no people out there. Um, Ramana loved to use the analogy of life being like a dream. And he says that, for example, the only difference between the dream we have whilst we're sleeping and this so-called waking dream is that the one is longer, this waking dream is longer. Otherwise, they're both projections of the mind. What I find is useful also is that when I'm sitting with a client, I generally have fairly discreetly behind and off to the side a picture of Ramana. And every now and then I look at that picture of Ramana and it brings me back to that sense of presence. It also reminds me that the person, the, the living body sitting in the chair is also Ramana. What I've come to realize is that God is living as me. God is here as me, but not as this body singularly. What I've come to realize is that God is all pervasive. God is the very energy that I call myself. And uh, it's become more and more clear for me to let go of the periphery, to let go of the story, to let go of the name, and just to experience God, just to be God. Looking back at our journey of discovery, we met many remarkable people and shared profound insights along the way. But perhaps it is the words of Ramana Maharishi that provide the most encouragement. He said, You and I are the same. What I have done is surely possible for all. You are the self now and can never be anything else. Throw your worries to the wind, turn within, and find peace. <laughs>